I'm Dave Monte with Airbrush Action Magazine, and I'm in Newport Beach, California with featured artist Noah from Noah's Art. Noah's going to be showing us how he creates his larger-than-life portraits on canvas. Over the next 60 minutes, he's going to take us on a complete thorough how-to of how he creates these fantastic images. Now let's take a minute to meet the man behind the artwork. Noah? Big Dave, what's up? How much? How you doing? Great. All right. I'd just like to thank you for having us here. Hey, my pleasure. All right. So basically, Noah, where do you start? Um, well, as far as the canvases or my ideas? Your ideas. Uh, where do you get most of your images from? Where do the ideas, uh, you know, occur uh, from your paintings? Well, basically, um, I, I love the whole fashion uh -huh. Look, I mean, right now it's a whole series on like sirens, mm -hmm. and you know, somewhat of an exotic woman or girls, uh, and you know, pe some people take that as being very show, you know, chauvinistic. But for me, it's the fact of just showing beauty or making people look glamorous. Like I would just take average people, like these, you know, these models. Um, and I got those ideas when I'd be out on the road. Here I am driving up to L.A. or something like that, and I see all these large billboards. I love working big. I don't like, you know, working really small and constricted. Mm -hmm. So um, the the images of, of faces, I was into portrait work, started there early on, you know, doing them on, on uh, t-shirts, actually. And I decided, you know, make a little bit more money, take them to canvas. So the ideas really came from my head. I don't want influences from other people or other artists. Um, I don't want to, to imitate them. So I decided that instead of going to magazines and postcards, uh, I had to control the image myself, so I started doing photo shoots. Okay. So basically you can control all of your images by, by doing your own photo shoots. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely more expensive. I mean, it takes a lot more work. All the, the grinding of normal, you know, commercial, doing logos, doing, you know, shoot, doing banners way back when and things like that, all paid off now and allowed me to build up enough money to dump it back into my canvas work. So. Um, got together with a really great photographer friend of mine, Milano, and what he allowed me to do was basically look through the camera, find the image that I wanted, and then he would just come behind the camera, shoot it for me. The great thing was, was I would be able to sit and, you know, watch over his shoulder as he was doing all the exposing of the film, and I could, you know, say, bring it up, drop it out, and what that allowed me to do was have total control over everything, right from the start. So hopefully, and we, there was some beginning pieces that I did black and white um, of shots out of magazines just to practice. So I do have some of those still hanging around, but everything now is images that are pure Noah, no, nobody else, and I own everything from the very beginning. All right, fantastic. What kind of canvases do you use? Um, I use a 48 by 60 inch uh, stretched box canvas. It's pre-made, made by uh, Art Alternative. Uh, I really like it. Um, it's it's really rigid. It's it, it can be re-stretched. It can pop out the wood framing in the back. You see, that's very important. Oh, obviously. absolutely. I mean, you can buy them to where they're, they're thin, uh -huh. and so the client can frame them if they want. But I go with a gallery ready is basically what it's called, which you can just hang right on the wall. Right. All right. How do you prep the canvas? Um, I take gesso. The, the thing is uh, that a lot of airbrush artists don't know is that you need to kind of dilute it to where it's kind of a milky formulation. Mm -hmm. Spread that on really thin. I do about four or five layers, which allows it a nice transparent buildup. Mm -hmm. And um, I sand in between coats with a really, really light grade sandpaper. Okay, so we got our reference material. We got the canvas. We've got it all sanded and prepped. How do you get those images onto the canvas now? Um, I project it. A lot of people think, or I've had like students come up to me, and um, people who aren't artists, and they think, oh, you're projecting it? Well, that's cheating. Mm -hmm. um, a couple things on that note. If I'm going to have a client paying me to paint their kids or something, you know, a couple thousand dollars or something like that, it better look like their kids. Right. There is a lot of tricks to it, and you can really mess things up in projecting. One is, when you project it, you got to make sure that you have that thing lined up. You can uh -huh. distor distort it, and the face will stretch. Some artists use that to their, their advantage um, and create that into their style. But basically, I really, really try to line that thing up perfectly. I go up, I go down, side to side, and then um, 
I'll, t I'll take a light pencil, like a number two pencil. Some guys like to use charcoal. Um, but I go in with the pencil, lightly do it. And all you have is after you've turned on the lights, all you have is you can barely see an eye. You have the placement of everything. Right. And there's tons of magic in just knowing how to work an airbrush to get that whole look from that point on. People think, oh, projecting, that's, that's a cakewalk. That's easy. It's not. It, it's, it's just as hard. All okay. that gives me is placement on such a large surface. Right. So you would definitely, definitely recommend projecting the image on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I use a quick draw uh, copy cake, and people think they got to go spend like hundreds of dollars on these projectors. And this little guy's a six by six format. And I'll take my photographs, reduce them down on a laser scan. That's another nice thing because it's not copyrighted, it's my own image. Right. I take it to a, a place that'll do a laser print of it, reduce it down to the size, mm -hmm. put it in the projector transfer it up there onto the canvas, trace it, then I look at that photo and I, and I go ahead and airbrush. But never use the one that you use to project okay. as your reference for painting, otherwise you'll get wrong values. I always use the original that I have. All right, great. So I have a big library. Great point. What kind of airbrush do you use? Um, an Iwata, uh, HPBC, an Iwata Micron, uh -huh. um, and, and an also an RG2. An RG2. And these, yeah, these are top of the line. I've tried a lot of others, and when I was doing t-shirts, I was using other kinds of airbrushes, but as soon as I went to the canvas work, it, I mean, it's now to the point where you cannot see one little granule of paint. It doesn't spray out or, or, or feather or give me mist, you know, misted little deals on the, on the edges. What, what happens now is so precise, it was like going from a Toyota truck to a high-end Mercedes. And it's, uh, it was almost too good, too precise for me. So it took some, some time warming up to the new brushes, but the Iwatas and, and uh, the paints from Medea are just unreal. Okay, so it's not only the preparation of the canvas, but also the equipment, the airbrush that you're actually using. Absolutely. What kind of paint do you use? Uh, I use Comart. Comart from Medea. Medea makes uh, Comart illustration paint. I prefer to go with the transparent black. Everybody always asks me, so how many blacks or grays do you use? And some people think that the old master's theory is using all these different grays. Well, that's fine. If Sometimes, depending on the coloration of the photo, if I want a little more antique look, I'll take it with uh, the smoke gray. And I don't use any opaques, transparents. And the, the, the good thing about that is it's very forgiving. Mm -hmm. What happens is I'll just layer it up slowly, you know, just time after time after time. And what is also beneficial of that is because of the layers of the gesso on the canvas, that's transparent to begin with. Then you build up all the layers of the transparent color or the black or the grays. And pretty soon it's like a lollipop. The originals you can look at, and it looks very, very deep. And that's the whole idea. That's what gives the depth to the eyes. I mean, you're creating an eye on there, but the eye is actually transparent as it is in real life. So um, I'd, if I use an opaque, it might be for a background, like going in and really trimming things out. Uh, most of the work is, is, I would have to say, freehand, you know, as well, so. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll go ahead and get right into the, to the image. All right. All right, well, here we are. I have my Micron airbrush here. I have smoke gray filled inside, which is transparent. I'm gonna go over to the reference photo right now. And you can see here, we have the whole image basically on one piece, and we have the whole image here on the canvas. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna come over here, and we're first gonna start with the eyes. So I take my image, plop it on right here where I can always keep referring to it and looking at it. Right now, my main focus is the eye source. You can see clearly the white highlights and the shadows that are happening in here, so that's our, our uh, trick that we need to pull off. If we don't hit these highlights and center everything perfectly, it's really gonna look bad. I start with the pupils, so I'm gonna go over, grab my loose frisket here, come up into this area, find the hole that best suits this one, which looks like that one. I don't spray heavy in here. I keep referring to the photo. Give myself a light, light. Her eyes are blue. So I'm gonna hit this area like so. So I have that. Now I'm gonna come in with a pupil, find the one that best suits that one, which looks like that. But don't overdo it though. Right now you could really kill the design. if you lay this in too heavy. 
You really got to spray close to your frisket. Otherwise, you can blow it. I have that there. I come over, start freehanding this in. This is fuzzy enough on the photo that it can actually be brought in just with the brush. The pupils, I want it a little bit tighter. You have a really nice shadow back here. The rest of the pupil, I'll start filling in like so. If your paint runs at all because it's really transparent, go ahead and let it come back in. And layer it up as it dries. Everything at this point has to be very, very light. So I'm just bringing in the slightest, slightest little shadows. Too much, and you will definitely ruin this design. That's why this airbrush is so good, because if it's got such a fine, fine spray, it doesn't give me really any problems at all. Go back in, hit the pupil a little more. Still looking at our light source and hitting every little detail. Definitely want to hit this detail here. Now you can hit this with a loose frisket if you want, but every picture is pretty fuzzy, so you don't want to make it too crisp, otherwise it doesn't look like a photo. So go ahead and keep spraying. Obviously, this whole area, oops, that whole area is really dark, so I have to portray that somehow. Now, this is just a smoke gray. I'm going to go back in with the darker, the darker uh, transparent black. <clears throat> so right now, I'm really playing off shadows and values. This crease underneath her eye. I think this is a really forgiving way of spraying because you can just keep layering up all these little elements and not worrying about so much mess up. So I'll go back over all this with uh, the transparent black. But for now, I'm going to be hitting everything with a light coat just to get the layout and make sure everything's right where I want it. Her makeup, you can see, is really dark. It has more gray than it does black. So I'm going to bring this really dark. Step away a little bit, take a quick look, darken up this area. If you stay in one place too long, it doesn't look very, very fun. So I'm going to be moving around here fairly quickly. Make sure that you imitate all the hairs as they wrap around the temple here. And hit this as slight as possible. Remember, this is just the smoke gray. You see, as you build it up, you can just keep very, very transparent look to it. I'm going to go back and trim this up. Now keep in mind that she has blue eyes, so they're going to capture a lot of light. I'm going to go back in and nail that white highlight, not with white. It's not good to use white on canvas, I think, if you're doing black and white portraits, because um, it's a difference of color no matter which kind of white you use. So I go back in and I pick that with an X-Acto or an eraser. Mark Fredrickson uses that a lot. Stephen Driscoll uses it a lot. I, I tend to think that it's a very good way of making things look natural. If you notice, I'm trying to imitate this eye being really round and capturing all the little details of this shadow. So you saw me just freehand and mist in really light. You're going to be working really, really light on most of this stuff. So until I get that white highlight on there, this isn't really going to read very, 
very strong. Make sure your picture's not too close that you'll cast a shadow or get an overspray mark. Lightly blending things in here. Playing off the small little subtleties in the, her eyelids. Coming back over and nailing some more of the shadows. More light shadows. Remember, black's gonna be coming in over the top of this. Now, the reason I'm using transparent smoke is because this photo has got a lot of lightness to it. I mean, the whole pic, there's not really one spot on the whole picture that's actually um, white. So even after I lay the white highlights, I'm gonna go back in and definitely hit some, uh, some gray over the top of them. Make this area sink back a little bit more. You see how I keep moving all over from place to place? I think that's a really, really good way of doing it. If you stay in one place too long, uh, you can definitely overdo it. And that's the easiest thing to do in black and white. So right now, you can see the light's captured right here. Boom, falling over her brow, her eyelid, touching the bottom part of her eye. <clears throat> so I'm going to start hitting some of these lashes and building up here. This is just a foundation for the transparent black. So there's one eye. All right, I basically uh, sprayed the other eye so it wouldn't be too time consuming, just like I did the other eye. Um, just came in with the transparent smoke, spraying the areas, capturing the shadows, and just finding where the value was and the layout, matching the other eye and looking for placement. She is at, I mean, she's somewhat three-quarter, almost dead on. I mean, she's more dead on than anything, but this eye is definitely a different view, so um, the light is hitting it a little bit differently, more on the inside rather than the outside. And after I've done both of these like that, I pretty much leave them and don't overdo it, and I transition to the nose. So in the nose, the most important area is, I think, the shadow underneath and then the highlight underneath. So what we're going to try to accomplish here, and the canvas is going to kind of wobble as I hit it, but I'm going to build up and start first with this reflection that I see underneath, which would be right underneath here. I can't overdo this because I want there to be a good bounce. So I'll just give myself just enough here on this little area and can come back on the other side, and this is a really crucial area. There, now I have that, that's fine, that's good enough for me, so I'm gonna come in and slowly, working really, really, really close to the canvas. The good thing about using the smoke gray is I can layer all this up, it's still not gonna get as black as the, uh, the darkest areas that I'll be using with the transparent black. Tons of dagger strokes or uh, rat tail strokes. And um, what I can also do is just come back and light, you know, shadely, uh, shade lightly, as I should say. And look at that nose. There still is subtleties in the shadow. So I have to Definitely, definitely play those off. This is about the darkest area on the right side. Come back in. Biggest interpretation with black and white is interpreting light. Nose. You can obviously see I haven't had any clogging problems. Every once in a while I get a little bit of tip dry, but frankly, this brush works perfect. Coming in, I'm hitting the nostril now. I 
You can see I'm starting to get the shadow now. And she's got this little bump underneath that I'm gonna try and play off of. And once the shadow gets sprayed, it's gonna very much give the illusion that there's a reflection coming up underneath. And yeah, you don't, I mean, you could use a loose frisket here, but frankly, I think it's best if you keep it kind of loose because that's gonna definitely, definitely look more like a shadow. So I'm gonna come over here. That's my frisket or my picture. Now we're starting to get that shadow. You're gonna really see it start to happen here as soon as you see the other nostril get sprayed. So as I come into this area, I'm gonna move my painting or my picture just a tad. Still being able to look at it. Keep referring to it. I think if you're constantly looking at your photo, it's a good thing. There's too many guys who try to wing it. I mean, if they want to, that's, that's fine, but trying to match this thing, especially if you're doing commissioned work for a client. Now, there's a shadow coming underneath this nostril, so that's what I'm gonna hit right there. All right, remember that. You'll see it a little bit later. I'm gonna round out the tip of her nose a little bit here. Come back up. Hit this little one like that. And uh, definitely trying to drop this reflection in by adding shadows underneath the nose or misting under, underneath the nose the whole, um, whole part here. Then what I'm going to do is go back in and develop certain areas like this indention on the side of her nose. You don't want to go too wide. You want to bring him in because her nose isn't very big. It's pretty small. So and as you do that, kind of do blends all the way into the nose, up into the crown, and taper all your lines up. This part's really hard because if you misinterpret it on the canvas, it'll really look off. So now I'm, I'm taking the lines up and looking where the white highlights are from the light. So slowly but surely, adding little by little. Make sure you step back, otherwise you can lose perspective. See how we have the bounce coming up from underneath? That's really important. That'll really give us the idea that it's three-dimensional. Popping that off. Let's bring this down a little bit more. This is where the uh, transparent smoke's really good. I'm gonna bring it in the cheeks a little bit more. Because it's so subtle, it looks so beautiful, rather than killing it with such a harsh black. So this whole area needs to be developed a little bit more. You can notice how many times I'm even stopping and making sure I'm not overdoing it. So now that's looking a lot better. Um, make sure that you don't, I mean, take into consideration the camera view right now is at an angle, so the image isn't distorted or projected wrong. But we're doing this so you can definitely see the view from where I'm spraying. Taper that up a little bit more. Blend that line off in the cheek. And what's so cool is that the uh, transparent black makes the gray look even lighter. So now our nose is looking really nice. Step off, take a look, blend that. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that for now. We're just about finished with the nose here. And um, I'd say that looks about good to me with the smoke gray. 
And now we will basically go to the lips, the luscious lips. All right, when we first started the lips, you notice that when I was projecting it, I made a trace of the lips and then I cut them out. So here's what I do in order that I can get somewhat of a crisp edge, but not too much. So I spray a little adhesion, about that much. Let that dry off a little bit. Don't want it to be too tacky, just enough to hold it on there so it won't blow away. So I position that to where I need it, like so. Now this is just for a hint of an edge. So I come in here, lightly spray around the edges like this. Not overdoing it because it's really a facade of how dark that is in real life. See, that's almost too dark to begin with, but that'll work. Throw that out. Then you come in, I'm gonna hit this edge of the shadow. Now this won't be too dark. I will over, um, over paint when I come in with the transparent black. But right now I'm just gonna get the idea of how I want the shadow to go underneath her lips. Don't worry about your paint moving around at all. It dries really quick and then you can just come back over the top. So I usually establish how dark I want this. And while this is drying, I go and I model the lips a little bit more. Make sure that you get the shadow to wrap around the bottom lip, which it does in the photo. Bring it up into the corner, which will capture her expression. She's got somewhat of a little smile. So hit that. Look at the other corner. It's a real crisp shadow. If I want to soften that up in the edge, I'll pull back, hit that. Then I'll come in and look at that shadow right here on the lips, coming in on the corner. So I'm gonna hit that. Make sure you don't overdo the shadow because all it is is a reflection coming off her skin. And try to use the white of the canvas as much as you can as the, the white highlights on the lips. If you can do that, it'll save yourself a lot of time and look a lot better. And I don't necessarily go in and paint all the veins and everything. I like the lips to look really soft really natural. We're getting there already. So, though I have that edge already sprayed and trimmed, it won't be very hard after I keep laying all this on. In order to get this bend coming around, I'll taper this up, then I'll shadow this corner, and that'll make it look like her lips sink back into her face. Same thing on this corner. And as for the shadow underneath, I'll hit that soft, trimming up at the very top. The pouty on the bottom. So I'll trim this hard, like that. And that follows the line to the other side. So that shadow is kind of lining right up. There's not too much of a bend to it, so I'll keep bringing it down. Then I'll step away from it and look at it again, making sure that I'm getting as much as I need out of it. Remember, you're still with the gray. You're not going to the black yet. So it needs to be more of a shadow. So I'll add more thickness down here. Like that, shading underneath, leaving the reflection on the bottom of the lip. And the more darker I make this, the more her lips are gonna pop out. So they're already starting to get there. Bring this up. On the top of the lips, the upper edge is darker. Make sure you don't have too many lines here. So I'll come up like this and fade down to the bottom because that 
the bottom part of the upper lip is going to have a reflection coming from the bottom one. And just keep following this curve. This one's actually darker. Because a viewer from five feet away or so is going to be able to not see that hard edge, but at least it was a reference for me to use. Mostly everything else we'll be able to do with the, the transparent black. I'm going to define that line in the middle a little bit more. doing something like that. And then there's tiny little lines here. This is about the most I'll do as far as lips, lines, or detail. And I come back in with the X-Acto or an eraser and um, trim that up. She's got a small little like dimple, so I'll hit that by building it up to the thickness that I like. There's a lots and lots of little different fades in the lips, but for the most part, I like to pop out that upper one and the bottom reflection on the bottom lip. and then it dips down in the middle. The black will take care of that distinction and then fade off a little gray on the sides because it'll indent down here. Then pick up, we're almost done with the gray and we're gonna take it into the black. The black will be used for the rest of the hair. Notice there's a lot of gray so I'm misting gray over the whole thing right now. Little by little. Reload a little bit here. And then come back in, hit this crease, and then taper this shadow down. These are really big dagger strokes right now. Taper this cheekbone in. And then I'm going to trim everything else up with a, French, with a French curve, which allows it to be a little crisp, but not too crisp. Right here is where you want to get the bounce coming underneath, underneath her um, chin. And then there's a line here for the cheek, so I'll be trimming that back up. It's lighter on this side, it's not as harsh. Just a little bit of a bounce. And then taper this into the corner of her mouth. Remember the white of the canvas is still gonna over dominate the face. It'll look pretty dark, but once you get the hair in, everything else will look pretty good. She's got a beauty mark. I'm guessing that is about right here. You notice that it's lit from the top and it's got a shadow, so you kind of haze that underneath it. I kind of go back over any areas that I missed with the gray and develop those areas just a little bit more before I get to the black. Make sure I haven't missed anything. This is where you start getting a little bit freer in your spraying, not being so crucial. The I mean, the hardest part is pretty much over. Now you just have to go over and build everything up a little bit more with the black. Make sure you keep stepping away and making sure that um, you're not getting too dark in areas. Remember that black's gonna do a lot for you. Just got a little crease here. She's got that little smirk. But I don't try to bring out too many qualities in the skin and try to keep it more porcelain like. And then I'll be switching actually to the, um, 
be switching to my HPBC because then I can put a bottle on it and not have to worry about it spilling. But for the fine detail work, I'll use the micron. Thicken up this a little bit. Add a little bit more shading here. And then the side. Right now, I'm really looking at the lighting coming off her temple and then back into where the hair ends up. Everything else can be taken care of with the black. So right there is about, about it for the gray. Everything else I can take care of. So that's that. All right, what I want to do here is on the underside of the chin, there's a big shadow. And you can see that line right here. And I'm going to play off of that and pop her face out more. Everything gets out of focus towards the bottom. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this French curve, find out where I can lay this, which looks about right here. And I have the shadows on the face I've already done. This is going to be kind of hard to see for a little bit. I still have the gray. And that gray is going to allow me to just get all the subtleties. And I'm using the uh, HPBC. And realize your canvas can take a lot of abuse. Take this tape off. Do the same thing down here. Do the same. This, you don't have to worry about. Sometimes that'll scare you, but you can disguise that in. Dry, try not to spray in that area as much. But if I can bring this out, this will carry out over into the hair, but that's fine. Bottom line, the most important thing is to get her face. That's really going to sink back there by the time I'm done with it. It's not too, so I mean, her face is not too soft as far as focus. But the most important thing is to interpret the shadow and the darkness coming off her neck. But now I can work basically with one hand, and I'm really far away from the canvas right now. OK, it's still pretty wet. What I'm going to do is come up in this area, blow some, some air on here for it to dry a little bit. and build that up. While that dries, I'll come over here and build this up. If I ever need to, I can always go back and hit with the French curve that same line. I'm still with the gray. I'm laying in this shadow. And from this point on, we'll be jumping ahead, especially when I get to the hair. Otherwise, it gets really monotonous as far as sitting here and watching me do all these little strands. But when it comes to a shadow like this, I will haze in this area and come down into our one breast here. And the other one is coming down here with hair like so.
this all has gray in it. Notice how I'm spraying it out of focus, which it is. The shadow's a little bit darker. This is still the gray. Looking into her jacket, I'll trim this area, give myself a little bit of value down here. And this is just going to fade off into the white canvas. This, this piece won't necessarily have a background. Do some shadows of the hair. Now, hair necessarily doesn't have to be exactly what you see. The reason I like these models is because I can go in and change the hair if I want to. So I have that option. That's what's nice about doing airbrushing, period, is that you can alter and change things. And you don't necessarily have to worry about seeing or spraying exactly what you are seeing. The hair down here. Accent accentuates her one breast. That's still pretty wet, so I'm going to let that dry. Next area, what, I'm, what I do with hair is, just so you guys get the idea, is I'll come in, I'll go, it's dark here, it's dark over here. It's dark inside this channel. I just pick out areas. The hair, you kind of move around quite a bit. Move my photo. Basically, it's like underpainting. And a good point to make is that uh, my, my friend uh, Steve Driscoll made a good point in one of his articles that you paint it, if you're painting a color photograph, you would paint the first color exactly as if that's the only color you're going to use. In my case, this might be the only color I'm going to use, period. So you try to do as much as you can with just each color. And I think that gives you a better quality. So as you can see, I'm just building everything up, shadowing areas still. Not really going into detail, but just finding out placement of everything. I try to make everything in um, all the hair. I try to give it little rooms, little places that you could stick your fingers into and just show texture. Then really detail it out towards the end. And you can see it's darker over here. I can come back and trim that up with a French curve if I want. But bottom line, you can see already where things are going. This is all out of focus. I might not, you know, depending on how I feel about the piece, I might not necessarily want to develop everything in this piece. This area is really accented. And if I was doing color, 
I would put clear between each coat of color, which means I'd, I'd use a clear pigment, which allows everything to be transparent and build up. Because when light captures it, it'll really make it beautiful. Now, so I'm going to switch color now, and I'm going to go to transparent black. So that's where I'll be when I come back. I'm going to do the final touches. I've taken in a little bit of black, transparent, transparent black into the rest of the painting. Now's the finishing touch onto the eye. So what I'm going to do here is I have the white highlight. So I'm scraping away here. <laughs> then for the reflection, I take an eraser to get that rounded edge or the, the reflection of the highlight. That's what gives the depth to the eyes. Then I will also highlight the bottom of that eyelid or the top ridge of the eyelid, right where the shadow falls. A little bit more in here. A little bit right here. To soften these up, 
I'll come in and I'll hit those. If I need to hit a little uh, white highlights on the tips here, I might pick this a little bit and then blend them in. But usually I don't highlight any of the, the eyelashes. I just smear that in. But that is it. Well, Noah, it's been a real treat seeing this image painted from start to finish. I'd like to really thank you for having us here. You bet. Thanks for coming by. I'm Dave Monick for Airbrush Action Magazine. Thanks for watching.